You're listening to the N2K Space Network. Imagine a world where you're always one step ahead of cyber threats, where your defenses are impenetrable because you see what others don't. Welcome to Team Cymru's Threat Intelligence Solutions. With real-time access to the world's largest threat intelligence data ocean, they enable you to turn the tables on attackers. Transform your security from reactive to proactive through accelerated threat hunting and incident response, made possible through automation. Empower your team with visibility and insights to start defending your organization like never before. Team Cymru. Be the hunter, not the hunted. Learn more at team-cumry.com slash cyberwire. That's team-cymru.com slash cyberwire. There are a lot of lawsuits going in Boeing's direction lately. I don't want to make light of that either. There are some very serious issues going on with Boeing, clearly given what's been happening with its airplanes in the last few years. And a Boeing lawsuit is our top item for the briefing today, but it's not what you might assume. This time, Boeing is the one filing the lawsuit. T-minus 20 seconds to LOS, T-dress, go for the floor. Today is March 26th, 2024. I'm Maria Varmazes. And this is T-Minus. Boeing sues Virgin Galactic over trade secrets. Ingersoll Rand to purchase ILC Dover for a cool $2.3 billion. Apex's Ares sends a selfie from space. And our guest today is Dr. Elena Hyde, director of York University's Allen I. Carswell Observatory. We're going to be discussing the April 8th solar eclipse here in North America, so stay with us for that chat. Here's a look at our Intel briefing for this Tuesday. Boeing and its subsidiary, Aurora Flight Sciences, are suing Virgin Galactic for $25 million. The lawsuit says that the sum of money is what Boeing is rightfully owed for its work on a new generation ship, which the lawsuit just refers to as the mothership and does not specifically name. The work that Boeing's lawsuit refers to came under a contract between the two companies in 2022, in which Boeing's Aurora agreed to provide design engineering services. In addition to the sought amount, the Boeing lawsuit also accuses Virgin Galactic of holding on to Boeing's intellectual property from this work, like test data and math equations, and demands that Virgin destroy this retained data. In the lawsuit, Boeing alleges that, and I quote, these trade secrets are proprietary information to which Virgin Galactic holds no contractual rights and that the retained intellectual property could be used by Virgin Galactic, and I quote again, to advance design of a new mothership on its own or with a different supplier. For its part, Virgin Galactic says, we believe this lawsuit is wrong on the facts and the law, and we will vigorously defend ourselves in the appropriate forum. Ingersoll Rand has announced its intention to purchase ILC Dover for approximately $2.33 billion dollars. ILC Dover is best known in the space world anyway for being the primary supplier of spacesuits for NASA, but it also makes products that are used for safe handling of pharmaceutical agents during drug manufacturing processes. Ingersoll Rand says it will establish a life sciences platform within its precision and science technology segment consisting of the company's life science-focused brands plus ILC. The deal is expected to close in the second quarter, and it includes an earnout tied to the achievement of select operating efficiency metrics in 2024. Hmm. Apex has announced a successful demonstration of end-to-end capabilities of the Ares platform. The company received what it's calling a selfie from the Ares serial number one call to adventure mission. The image was taken by a payload owned by Apex, which completed commissioning last week. The picture was taken by a camera mounted on the satellite bus's payload deck. 
And the company says that all the major subsystems, including power, thermal, GNC, and communications, all had to work together to acquire and downlink the photograph, which Apex says proves the mission's success. Space-based data analytics and space services company Spire Global has closed its previously announced registered direct offering of over 2 million shares of Class A common stock at a purchase price of $14 a share. The gross proceeds of the sale will provide the company with approximately $30 million before deducting placement agent commissions and other offering expenses. The company has also issued the investors in the offering an option to acquire up to an additional approximately 2 million shares at a price of $14.50 per share until 100 days from the date of closing, which could result in additional gross proceeds of approximately $31 million. Spire Global says it intends to use the net proceeds from the offering for repayment of debt, working capital, and general corporate purposes. What a world we live in when a SpaceX Falcon 9 launch no longer even makes any kind of headline. Today, however, it's worth mentioning that Monday's flight, which launched a further 23 Starlink satellites to low-Earth orbit, was also the 175th flight of the vehicle from Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. And speaking of SpaceX, the company held a static fire test of six Raptor engines for the next Starship vehicle. The company says the test is in preparation for the next Starship launch, which is expected, fingers crossed, as early as May. SpaceX and the FAA are still analyzing data from the March 14th launch of the Super Heavy vehicle, and SpaceX aims to launch the Starship a further six times this year. We'll see about that. And staying in Texas, the state governor, Greg Abbott, held a press conference at NASA's Johnson Space Center to announce the new Texas Space Commission. Now, with the Texas Space Commission, our great state will have leaders who are laser focused on advancing the next generation of human space exploration and connecting that exploration with real-life economies here in our country and across our globe. They will encourage the development of emerging technologies, promote economic development for space, aeronautics, and aviation, guide research into space exploration all across our state, help to develop workforce training needed to return to the moon and to eventually reach Mars. And they will cultivate the infrastructure needed to establish space sports and so much more. As we return to the stars with a renewed zeal, NASA is teaming with Texas companies like SpaceX, Firefly, Blue Origin, and so many more to achieve the latest dreams of manned space exploration. Texas will be the launch pad for Mars. And as we look to the future of space, one thing is clear. Those who reach for the stars do so from the lone star state, the great state of Texas. And now I will pass it to the... Admittedly, we're still not sure what the Space Commission is or what it will be doing in the near future, and that's on us. But we can say that this is a hyped-up press conference that we think could have been better covered, maybe in an email. Hmm. Moving on. Intuitive Machines says its lunar lander has come to a permanent end of life. The Houston-based company shared the message that OD has permanently faded after cementing its legacy into history as the first commercial lunar lander to land on the moon. The solar-powered Odysseus operated on the lunar surface for seven Earth days, which was the expected length of the lander's surface mission. However, Intuitive Machines held out some hope that the lander, fondly referred to as Odie, would wake up when sunlight bathed its solar arrays once more. Alas. A package of 3D mapping technology designed by Australia's National Science Agency, also known as CISRO, has reached the International Space Station after being launched on SpaceX's 30th Commercial Resupply Services mission. The payload was developed in partnership with Boeing and with the support of the ISS National Laboratory and NASA Ames Research Center. The technology will provide multi-resolution scanning for potential use in monitoring unmanned outposts. 
Astronauts will fit the device onto a NASA robot called Astro B that roams the station and can assist with a range of tasks, including mapping the layout of the orbiting lab. I love Astro B. I'm always happy to talk about it. <laughs> And that concludes our briefing for today. Head to the selected reading section of our show notes to find further information on all the headlines that we've mentioned. You'll also find an announcement from Momentus about their new CFO and details from Venus Aerospace on their inaugural supersonic drone flight. Hey, T-Minus crew, if you're just joining us, be sure to follow T-Minus Space Daily in your favorite podcast app. So if you could do us a favor, share this intel with your friends and coworkers. So here's a little challenge for you. By Friday, please show three friends or coworkers this podcast. That's because a growing audience is the most important thing for us. And we would love your help as part of the T-Minus crew. So if you find T-Minus useful, please share it so other professionals like you can find the show. Thank you so much for your support. It means a lot to me and all of us here at T-Minus. And now, a word from our sponsor, Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI. Our guest today is Dr. Elena Hyde, director of York University's Allen I. Carswell Observatory. I spoke to Elena about the solar eclipse that's coming up on April 8th across North America and what viewers can expect on that day. There's an absolutely massive eclipse event coming up this year on April 8th, and this will affect a huge region of North America uh, covering parts of Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. Um, so this eclipse path is going to have a wide swath and pretty much throughout all of uh, North America, with the exceptions of Alaska from the U.S. and uh, parts of the Yukon um, and actually a corner of British Columbia. They won't be able to see anything, uh, but the rest of us will. So even in over in Vancouver, they're going to get a partial eclipse. Um, you know, in Winnipeg, they're going to get a partial eclipse. In Nebraska, they're going to get a partial eclipse. Here in Toronto, partial eclipse. Um, however, if you want to know where the real action is, there's a very narrow little swath that's going to get the total eclipse. And so that's the spectacular image that most people will have seen online of, you know, the sun becomes dark and you get this beautiful white glow around it. That's the corona. And that is something, and this is very important, you are only going to see if you are in one of these very narrow region areas that is covered by totality. Um, so there's a huge amount of places that are going to experience a partial eclipse, which means you won't notice anything unless you have viewing technology out. So you have viewers, you've got safety rated glasses, something like that, a pinhole camera. Um, so for people who are looking uh, for eclipse glasses, um, just keep in mind that there are verified sellers. So you do want to make sure you get the real ones. Um, do not and I, uh, do not use sunglasses. Do not look directly at the sun. Do not use regular sunglasses of any kind. Um, they do not work to actually protect your eyes from the sun. You could really, really get bad damage to your eyes. And, and people have been known to go blind from this. So I just don't want to have people getting eye damage. Um, but uh, if you go to the time and date or the um, eclipse.aas, they have lists of solar viewing glasses for eclipses. 
And I guess uh, you folks in the U.S. don't have a Canadian tire, but um, you do have Walmart and they actually do have NASA. Most places that I've seen have NASA solar viewers, uh, especially when you have a fairly large portion of your partial eclipse being uh, being an event. So if you're if you're at, uh, you know, 30 percent or higher, you have something to see. Assuming there is no heavy cloud cover, which is what I am betting on where I am located on that day. <laughs> yes. And that's if you have heavy cloud cover, um, even in the heaviest heavy cloud cover, if you are in totality, you will still notice something because it will go from being heavy cloud cover to being nighttime amounts of darkness. Um, and the animals will still react, actually, to that shift. And so one of the interesting things about totality is that it is an experience. The temperature changes, the wind will change, the animals re will react because light, and I mean, we could get into a whole discussion about light pollution. Light is very important <laughs> to our environment, our nature, even the bugs and the, you know, the bird, as I say, the birds and the bees, everything responds to light levels. And so when you have a sudden change, like you do in totality, there's lots of different things you can notice. And so it's a very unique and special event that I have never seen. <laughs> so me neither. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm going to get in the car and drive and hope for the best. Um, but, uh, you know, if you are in that path, you, you can't help but notice it. So, you know, just make sure you're not like driving somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, you don't want to be distracted when totality hits you. But it's a very, 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 and I, I emphasize the word very, very small part of anywhere that's going to see the totality. So statistically speaking, you're not going to see it <laughs> um, unless you are in one of these very um, small areas. And just a little bit of fun trivia even in Canada, up in Montreal, only half of the city gets to see it. Oh, so <laughs> that's that's actually managed to go past half of their uh, half oh, of that's their city. Funny. I know a bunch of people going to Montreal for that, so I better I better check in with them for that. Yeah, check, <laughs> like, make check sure you're in. the right part of the city. <laughs> Um, there are a few cities like that. So some places, uh, like of course Niagara Falls, very popular, um, both sides of the border, totally covered by totality. You're good. So if you're in Niagara Falls, you you absolutely will get to experience totality in some form. If you do happen to be able to experience totality, it's not a super long event, though, right? It's just a few minutes, right? Uh, minutes uh, is 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 the long form. So this event will be between something like one minute, uh, maybe even less, all the way to three or four minutes depending on where you are. And so it is absolutely vital to get yourself a good eclipse uh, calculator. And, uh, you know, I know I mentioned, of course, Niagara Falls earlier. So Niagara Falls is in a pretty good place. They're getting three minutes and 30 seconds approximately. You know, the farther away you get from the center of totality, the less you get. So you go a little bit outside of Niagara Falls or Rochester and you go out to like two minutes um, you get on the edge of of totality, um, like that. I say the the line that's going through Montreal. Montreal, yeah, uh, yeah. So you go through the edge there, and you might only get thirty seconds of totality or less. So if you've just walked across the line, it'll it'll be a, a blink and you'll miss it. That's amazing. Oh my gosh does does your location in terms of how north or south you are, if you're on that line of totality, I'm just thinking of people, for example, who are going to be gathering in Texas. There's a bunch of people. Doing like oh parties. yeah, well te Texas is um, Texas is a great location. Um, I know it's it is basically going sort of right through Dallas, um, and a few other places in Texas are getting pretty good shows. Um, but Dallas itself, it's worth noting, is not going to get all that much time. So it's a little off of totality. So if you go, if you went. But is at west of Dallas, um, and I guess you'd have to drive along one of the highways going west. You could get out to a place where you're in the center of totality, and you'd get four minutes and twenty three seconds, which is pretty good. Four that's minutes, pretty good. Yeah, I was um, say, you go when, to Dallas, it's down yeah. to three minutes and fifty two seconds. That's so, still not too bad. I mean, it's I, not I mean, bad. It's not <laughs> bad. But if you keep if you keep going to the edge, it'll go down lower and lower. So, um, you know, if we're talking about the Dallas region, by the time you go out towards, uh, um, you know, Fort Worth, it's down to two minutes. That's that's still not too bad. I mean, yeah, when we're talking about like animals being affected by the darkness, I, to me, I'm thinking. I, I was just thinking it was just a matter of maybe thirty seconds, and I'm going. 
don't they need like a cool down period of like a dusk or something? But just, it's almost like the lights go off and, and you know, it seems like the many of them immediately react, I guess. Well, that's yeah. And so as as totality is happening, what you can what you can imagine is so the light from the sun is is being blocked and the moon is casting the shadow on the earth. And so the shadow of the moon is actually fairly wide, um, but the darkest point of the shadow, that's what you need for totality. And so you have this whole region of atmosphere, of air, that's all of a sudden getting colder. And it's, it's getting a little shock of, of cold. And so what happens when you make a bunch of air a little bit colder than it used to be? Well, it creates wind gusts. It can create little um, little winds and, uh, um, you know, basically clues to the animals that something is is happening. How noticeable it is will depend on... I mean, obviously, if there's a big storm happening, that's going to throw this out the window. But, <laughs> um, you know, you can get a pretty noticeable effect. And the the reaction from animals in the area will depend on how much time they've had to react and how much they notice. And obviously, if you're if you're in a very calm place with clear weather you'll get a much bigger effect and uh, more more noticed by by the animals involved and which animals you'll have to go ask uh, you'll have to we'll have to get a biologist on yeah that, <laughs> see, I'm, a, I'm asking you questions that are not related directly to your field of study but I figured I would ask um the 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 other question I have about this upcoming eclipse is I keep hearing about it being a specifically uh, extraordinary in some way I don't know if that's just hype but then I'm also hearing about that it's like the only one we're going to have in a large part of North America for a very long time. On average, there's an eclipse somewhere on Earth every 18 months. But the chance of it hitting you is real low. So it, it will be well over 100 years before another eclipse um, comes along this kind of path to hit in our area. Um, and by our area, I mean the sort of Toronto, New York part of North America. You and I are both in like the north northeastern part of North America. Yeah, we're in the, up yeah, in that exactly. area. Yeah, exactly. So we, we would have to wait quite a while to get another eclipse here. Um, when are you ever going to be this close again? If you are uh, not afraid to travel, you can always take eclipse cruises. And a lot of them uh, do go through the ocean. Um, so <laughs> given our, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> given what, how much ocean there is in the world. Yeah, what's funny is I won't be home for the eclipse, so I'm going to completely miss it because I'm going to be at a conference where the eclipse is not going to be happening, which is just killing me knowing that. Oh, man. Yeah, so if your, if your conference can relocate anywhere is into the eastern half of North America, you're, uh, you're good to go. I know. It, you know, they, it will be in Colorado, so I will be oh. nowhere near. Yeah, I know. It's, a, it's like, oh, there's an eclipse in my backyard and I won't be there to see it. Fantastic. Well, <laughs> Col Colorado will get 66%. Oh, that's not too so bad. So it's maybe not, I can see a little bit. It's not yeah. too bad. So, so, and this is something to keep in mind. Colorado will have the partial eclipse. And the farther west you go, uh, the less of a partial eclipse you will get. So, for example, San Francisco, uh, California is only going to get a 35% eclipse. Um, if you go up to Vancouver in uh, British Columbia, Canada... Only 17% eclipse. So they Sorry, really don't Vancouver. get much. Well, yeah. Um, but yeah, th as I say, so this one of the things that, that people have noted is, of course, because it covers such a wide part of, of North America, um, you can be many places and see this eclipse. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9. With available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults. With zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute. And available lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome back. And have we got a story for you today. Imagine if your resume read 2022 Time Woman of the Year, 2019 Nobel Peace Prize nominee, and future astronaut. Impressive, right? 
Well, that's the reality for Amanda Wynn. Space for Humanity has announced that it is sponsoring Amanda Wynn's dream of becoming an astronaut. She will be heading to space on a Blue Origin New Shepard flight as part of the organization's Citizen Astronaut Program. Amanda is a civil rights activist and founder of RISE, and she's known for her work on the Sexual Assault Survivors' Rights Act and advocacy for Asian American rights. She will become the first Vietnamese woman to fly to space. Executive Director of Space for Humanity, Antonio Peronacci, said, Space for Humanity could not be more proud to team up with and support Amanda Wynn's journey to space. Amanda's novel voyage will represent a much overdue, shining example to countless others. We here at T Minus cannot think of a more deserving recipient of a space flight and know that Amanda will be an incredible inspiration to many all around the world. She also already is. That's it for T Minus for March 26, 2024. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth, mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our associate producer is Liz Stokes. Our executive producer is Jen Iben. Our VP is Brandon Karp. And I'm Maria Vermazes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. We know there's an experience gap in cybersecurity, and companies are often enamored with the idea of building teams of superstars. But focusing on a team of unicorns just feeds the talent gap. Join N2K's Simone Petrella and Intuit's Kim Jones on Wednesday, March 27th, for an online discussion about the pivotal role security leaders play in shaping the security workforce landscape and how we can start showing up for the future of our industry. Visit our show notes for details and to register. This podcast is sponsored by SRM, your first call for cybersecurity and investigations. SRM is a global leader in cybersecurity, trusted by the world's most successful businesses to provide unrivaled cyber incident response, proactive services, and digital forensics. SRM invests in creating a team culture that allows the sharpest thinkers to thrive and deliver award-winning results for their clients. Their solutions and advice are specific for each client, actionable, and delivered in language that they can easily understand and act on. What executive team doesn't need that kind of service in the face of today's cyber threats? To learn more about why SRM should be your first call, no matter what your cyber challenges are, search your first call. Music.